All right, well, welcome back to our second video. I know you're itching to get your hands busy building and making stuff uh, using LEGO Digital Designer. I thought we would get some of the more boring elements of this uh, training series out of the way with just a little bit of background info as to why would e we would even care uh, about making a digital model in the first place. This is gonna serve as sort of a brief uh, introduction to the world of computer-aided design, which is its own immense uh, and deep subject. You can go to school for many years uh, just learning about CAD. Uh, so we certainly won't cover all of that in this session, uh, but the idea here is we should walk away with an appreciation for why we would even be interested in using these tools. So let's take a look. Uh, some of the things we're going to cover in this series is we're going to take a look at the design process. Some of you might call it the industrial design process. Uh, we're going to look at the benefits of using a computer-aided design, computer-aided engineering system. And uh, that's ultimately going to serve as our um, foray into LEGO Digital Designer and of course the project that we're going to be taking a look at uh, for the remainder of this course. So to the uninitiated here, this is our engineering design process. Almost any technical problem that gets solved in this world today um, looks something like this, or at least the thought process for it does. We always start off with a problem, right? A problem we're trying to solve. And part of solving that problem is understanding what are the various components of the problem. Is it is it a big problem that can be broken up into smaller, more manageable challenges? Uh, what are the constraints that we have to work with? Do we have enough time? Do we have enough money? Uh, do we have the technical know-how and expertise to solve this problem? Or do we need to talk to somebody else? Those are all the kinds of things that we would typically do uh, in the first stage. The second part, and the fun part to all of this, um, is the imagining stage. And this is where we're going to try and figure out a solution to our problem, right? So we're going to brainstorm ideas and choose the best one. This will ultimately necessitate um, us needing to plan our solution, right? So we might have to draw you know, detailed diagrams uh, to convey how our problem might be solved. We might have to uh, you know, do a lot of writing in terms of documentation to explain to other people uh, how we plan to go about solving our problem. And then finally, uh, this ultimately takes us to the create and improve uh, stages. We're going to create a solution, we're going to test it out um, and see if it works. And of course there's always room for improvement, right? I mean, just look at Windows, how many versions of Windows are they on and they still haven't gotten it right. So. Um, that is our engineering design process. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to try and relate these distinct stages to a real world problem. And that real world problem uh, comes with driving a car. So just off the top of your head, what are some of the problems that are associated with driving a motorized vehicle? Well, you know, all sorts of bad things can happen when you're, say, driving distracted. For example, you're using a cell phone uh, while you're driving or you're driving drunk. Um, you know, we, we can cause accidents that way. Um, what other problems come with driving a car? Well, you know, not everybody can drive. So how do the elderly, uh, handicapped, or very young uh, get around without being able to drive? And then, you know, what are some other problems that drivers commonly face? Uh, for example, finding a place to park when you're short on time, uh, getting stuck in traffic, uh, having to drive to the weather conditions. These are all problems that drivers have to contend with. We might consider this our first stage in our engineering design process. So lo and behold, uh, these problems are actually being pursued right now by Google. Uh, if you're not aware of, uh, Google right now is working on a driverless vehicle. And uh, the earliest prototypes, and this picture is probably a couple of years old, look something like this. Uh, what we see actually is that we have a, a standard vehicle with a number of sensors. Uh, the most obvious one is here on the roof of the car. And a driverless car is a way that we might go about solving uh, some of the problems that we mentioned with distracted driving, with being able to shuttle and chauffeur people who uh, otherwise couldn't drive around from point A to point B. So this is Google's idea uh, for how we might solve this problem. So I'm going to do a great injustice to what a complicated project this is, but let's take a look at some of the planning. You know, how might this car determine what road it's on? Um, how wide is the road? How many lanes? How fast can it safely travel uh, with traffic or with no traffic? 
Uh, what might happen when vehicles, cyclists, pedestrians are detected? Uh, what is the safe distance to keep between other vehicles? These are all uh, contingencies uh, that you know the Google driverless car has to deal with. And here we just see a very uh, summary uh, or rough drawing here of just explaining the basic components of their driverless technology. We see things here, for example, like uh, GPS, a global positioning system, so the car knows where it is on the road. Uh, for all of you Mindstorms buffs out there, they even Google uses ultrasonic sensors. So we can see that this car is no exception. It has an ultrasonic sensor to help detect uh, uh, its position, the car's position, relative to other vehicles and uh, objects on the road. And then, for example, we can see that there's radar sensors um, here at the front of the car and a video camera. So, you know, with our solution and our plan, next comes the interesting part. This is where we're going to be creating stuff using typically um, software. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of different CAD tools we can get into. We're going to discuss a couple, few of them in the next minute or two. Uh, but the end result of this process is um, coming up with improvements, right? So here's some interesting facts uh, from the Google driverless car experience. As it would turn out, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, a lot of people were untrusting of driverless technology, right? You know, go figure. Uh, people have been driving for so long, they, they are uh, reluctant to trust a machine. So some of the ideas that came out of that first iteration of the engineering design process at Google was to redesign the car to appear cute, friendly, non-threatening. Here we can see in the second version of the car, we still have a lot of the same technology. For example, we see the big sensor here on the roof, uh, but the car looks considerably different, right? It's much more uh, appro approachable looking. And uh, the idea here is that people want to feel as if they're still in control. So most people grab the steering wheel at some point during their experience uh, with the driverless vehicle. Uh, so, you know, one of the issues here, contingencies to be planned, is how might some level of control be offered? Perhaps video display, voice commands that allow a driver to interrupt uh, the automated um, uh, system that's controlling the vehicle. In the end, and this kind of sounds like a weird analogy, but Google actually wants this driverless car experience to resemble that of riding a horse. And there's, it sounds like a weird thing to compare, but think about it this way. If any of you have ever gone trail riding on a horse, those horses have been on those trails so many times that they actually know where they're going. They don't need you to steer them or show them what to do. Uh, they're just trained to follow a path. But, you know, to the tourist riding on the horse, he or she gets, you know, the reins in their hand and it feels as if they're in control. Uh, even though they actually aren't and they have no idea of how to control the horse. The horse just knows uh, what to do on its own. So in a weird way, um, the ideal experience would be to have a driverless vehicle that gives the operator or passengers in the car um, the uh, the chance to interrupt and, and control the vehicle or perhaps just create the illusion of control. Uh, and, and those are all problems with overcoming a uh, lack of confidence in driverless systems. So this is an example now of getting out of that first iteration of the design process and going into the second iteration now. And of course it starts all over again. So how can design ideas be communicated? Well, long, long ago, uh, a lot of things were just eyeballed and that's why we have, you know, crumbling structures, leaning towers of Pisa, um, you know, buildings with sloppy foundations. Um, because things back long ago in, in antiquity were created more for beauty than for technical merit. And usually the person leading construction was some kind of king, tyrant, general, and not always technically inclined or skilled. Um, so that that in combination with poor quality of building tools meant that it was hard to exactly replicate what was shown in a drawing. And as we fast forward towards the Industrial Revolution and, and, and Renaissance before it, uh, what we really see is with advancements in mathematics and geometry, um, all of a sudden it becomes possible to draw with a greater level of precision. And one of those uh, benefits is that the idea of drawing to scale is soon introduced. And this is especially important uh, throughout the Industrial Revolution with the introduction of patents. Uh, now for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with the idea of a patent, basically it's a mechanism that an inventor can use to protect his or her uh, ideas, right? So the, so, uh, the idea, pardon the pun, 
is to um, document your, your invention and um, to explain it in a precise enough way that uh, nobody can basically copy or steal it from you. And one way is that we can do that is through technical drawing, as we see here with this minifigure here and the different um, uh, measurements that are being taken along the different sides and faces of this model. So unfortunately, probably the biggest problem with this is that it's incredibly time consuming to draw things by hand. Um, and even more problematic is what do you do with the issue of errors, right? So in my past life, I worked in an architecture office that was really old and some of their very first projects, um, you know, going back to the 40s and 50s, there was uh, these very big commercial buildings and they, you know, built, did all the technical drawing by hand. So what it meant is that you had to have teams of dozens or so uh, senior level professionals supervising the work of the more junior people that were doing the drafting. So very time consuming and error prone. Stepping in closer to our time from the 1970s through uh, present, uh, what we have is with advancements in computers, uh, commercial CAD applications become possible. And with increasing processing power, it allows for increasingly more complex models to be built with fewer people and in less time. Uh, the best part, though, is that by using computers, data contained in the models can be easily checked and verified, and with a minimal level of human intervention. So what are some of the kinds of uh, CAD tools that are being used in industry? Well, um, a lot of professional roboticists uh, use uh, SolidWorks as a professional uh, technical drawing tool. Here we can see an example of a robotic hand uh, that we can bring uh, into our simulated environment to work with. Uh, alternatively, Autodesk, which is uh, as a competing product to SolidWorks, has a, its own uh, version of that called Autodesk Inventor. And we can see here that it's essentially the same thing, just uh, done a little differently. Okay, so now we're getting closer to the fun stuff. Lego Digital Designer is the tool that we're going to be using throughout this training series. As we saw in the overview video, it's a amazingly easy and intuitive way to construct 3D models. And best of all, it's totally free. So how can you argue with that, right? Um, what I was surprised to learn is that Lego designers in Denmark actually on occasion will use this tool when trying to develop new kits. And that's because you can apply filters and restrain your palette uh, of available bricks to just certain kits, right? So it's an incredibly useful tool for building. Um, what's even probably more impressive about this is that anything we create in LEGO Digital Designer, we can easily generate a set of printable building instructions for constructing the physical model. Uh, if we've happened to constrain ourselves to the kits that are available to us, uh, we can also use LEGO Digital Designer as a basis for creating a physics enabled simulation uh, using the Virtual Robotics Toolkit. We'll be talking about that a little bit more at the end of the video series. Uh, what makes this all possible is LDRAW. And LDRAW is basically an open standard for LEGO CAD programs that allows the user to create virtual LEGO models and scenes. Uh, you can use it to document models you've physically built, uh, create building instructions just like in LEGO, and render 3D photorealistic images. Uh, most importantly though, there's a number of tools outside of LEGO Digital Designer that export to this file format. So it's a very popular file format. Uh, for working with uh, 3D LEGO. Uh, in the next video, we'll actually talk about the installation and setup process for LDRAW. Uh, at this time, though, I'm just trying to draw an awareness that we are going to be using the LDRAW library when constructing our models. Okay, so why virtual robotics? At this point, some of you may have played a little bit with LEGO Digital Designer. Some of you might be totally new to it. Uh, some of you might be Mindstorms users that are used to working with the real robot. So why would you ever want to do this virtually when you have the real thing in your hand? Well, there's a couple of good reasons. Uh, the first being that through the magic of it being virtual, it makes it possible to work with our robot even when it isn't physically available. Now imagine this. You are a first LEGO League team. How many robots do you have on your team? My guess is that you don't have a robot for every team member. So in this way, what we can do is that each of the team members in a virtual environment can work and construct a 3D 
model of your competition robot and then come back to your team meetings on Saturdays, Sundays, whenever you meet, uh, informed and prepared uh, for the next week's session. Right now this is very difficult if you have to share one robot between five or six um, uh, team members. So that's probably the biggest advantage of virtual robotics is that it makes it possible to work with the robot even when it isn't physically available. Um, obviously because we're not uh, encumbered with the limitations of reality, uh, we can provide a much greater variety of challenges and environments. We can pretty much create anything we want to in a virtual space. So it gives us, uh, adds a lot of longevity uh, to the Mindstorms play experience. Of course, the most frustrating thing about working with real Lego is that you happen to lose bricks. And even worse than that, sometimes you step on lost bricks and that really sucks. Uh, so in a completely virtual space, it's always easy to find pieces. And if you're like me and you invest a lot of time building something, you usually don't want to pack it up, destroy it, and put it in a box. So if we build it virtually, uh, one of the great things about doing it in that way is that we can build our model once and it's ours to keep forever, uh, which ultimately makes it easy for us to share our files uh, with friends around the world. And so I have friends scattered to the four points of the globe and we swap models back and forth, program code, so forth. Uh, and it's obviously a lot easier to do this than mailing around physical Lego. Okay, and for those adults in the room, virtual robotics is a much, much cheaper alternative to the real thing. So for basically the cost of one real robot, you could pretty much outfit uh, an entire computer lab with the virtual robotics toolkit. So it's not a replacement for the physical robot, although you don't need the physical robot to use the virtual robotics toolkit. Uh, what this really is here is it's a capacity enabler, right? So all of a sudden I can take that investment I have in a single robot and greatly extend uh, the number of students that are able to work with it by working with virtual versions of a simulated Mindstorms robot. This is the robot we're going to be working on. I was uh, very fortunate that my friends here at Robots2DOS um, allowed me to uh, use their model. Um, for those of you that were familiar with the old uh, nxtprograms.com, there was a very easy to make robot. It was called the five minute robot. And if you were really good at building it, you could build it in about 20 minutes. <laughs> this is an EV3 version of it. And I have uh, great appreciation. I want to extend my special thanks uh, to robots to dos uh, for allowing me to use their model in this video tutorial. And that's a link to their website, which is chock full of all sorts of really interesting and great uh, tutorials. I highly recommend you taking a peek at it. This is the virtual version of what we're going to be building using LEGO Digital Designer. And at the conclusion of this series, we will detail how we can take this finished 3D model, uh, which is essentially just a static piece of 3D geometry and animate it uh, in, that is imported into the virtual robotics toolkit uh, so that it becomes a living, breathing, physics-enabled simulation. In other words, it's going to become a real robot that isn't real. Okay, so that's done for now. Uh, I'm not going to blab anymore. Um, let's get our hands busy with taking a peek at LEGO Digital Designer.